Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you will never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcasts on jimmyhinton.org or findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. All right, welcome to this week's podcast. Thanks for joining. Here with Jimmy Hinton. And here with Jimmy's mom, Clara. Nice to have you all. And this week we want to talk about a topic that... Um, it, it's really close to our hearts and it's really important. And, uh, you know, we, we allude to it, but, but we wanted to dedicate a whole episode to talking about faith. Um, I know this may not apply to, to all of our listeners, um, but probably the majority of you. And, uh, this is just such a deep, deep issue for so many people. And it's this issue of when, when you are a survivor of any kind of abuse, um, that automatically just makes you question so many things about your faith. It makes you question God. It, it makes you question his protective care. Uh, it makes you question his, his love for you. Um, heck, it even makes you question what you did to deserve the abuse. Even though, you know, as ri- ridiculous as that sounds, from a survivor standpoint, you know, they often tell me that, you know, we wonder what we did to, to deserve, to this. deserve this right. or to, to oh, have, that's, that's have this happen to us. Ridiculous thought at all that, and, and you feel so unworthy of yeah. anything. You, yeah. You truly, that, that's good. You, you just get to a point of where you just don't feel worthy anymore. And so, you, you know, the one, the one area that I really hone in on and, and specialize, you know, with within the field of abuse, I really specialize um, on this phenomenon of abuse in open spaces. So abusers who, though abuse, whether it's sexual abuse or um, violence or covert abuse or whatever it is, um, they do it very blatantly in front of other people. And especially they do it in the churches. Like it, it's like the more demented the person is and the more evil and twisted they are, the more likely they are to abuse within the four walls of a church building during service hours. Okay. Jimmy, you and I have had long discussions about this, but for our listeners, explain just briefly what you mean by that. How, how does an abuser abuse blatantly within a church confines well, of a church. Yeah, I mean it's so I, I talk about testing versus grooming. Okay, so everything that an abuser does is testing. They're testing uh they're testing their their potential victims, but they're also testing people around them. But another component to that is they're testing themselves. They're testing themselves because of arrogance, pride, um, narcissism, whatever you want to call it, that they're testing their skill level to see how good they are at getting away with the abuse. And that's really important for an abuser, especially when the stakes are, are, are higher and what they're doing is highly illegal. So you're talking about felony crimes and they need to, to, to do these series of testing to make sure that they can get away with it. And so part of that testing, a big part of that testing, is doing things in broad, plain sight of other people. And we would never in a million years guess that somebody would blatantly abuse a child. And I'm I'm talking full-on abuse. I'm not talking light petting kind of stuff. I'm talking full-on abuse. We would never guess that this stuff goes on right in front of us and that we would miss it. But the reality is it goes on in front of us all the time and we miss it almost 100% of the time. And that's not because we're dumb or we're, you know, we're ignorant or anything like that. It's that they're using very specific techniques to, to intentionally, um, 
play with our attention, our spotlight of attention. And, you know, they're using redirection. They're, they're, they're having us focused on, uh, all kinds of different things, uh, as they're dialoguing with us, as they're talking with us. And another thing that's, that's really important is they, they tap into our emotions in order to play with our spotlight of attention. And so emotions become a crucial point of entry for them um, to be able to steal our spotlight of attention. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this in past podcasts. We, we have, and I would say to people who are just joining us, and, and you know, maybe this is your first or second time listening to a podcast, go back to the beginning and listen, because uh, the foundation for what Jimmy's talking about was set in, in previous podcasts. And it's really important that you understand this testing that these abusers do. And I would point you too to the, the video that I did with, um, doctors Macknick and, uh, Martinez Conde. And, you know, really go on my website, look at the video section and watch these videos, because it's really, really important to understand this, to understand the science behind it and to understand what makes us susceptible and how common this is. It's so common. So that's the area that I really specialize in. But beyond that, when, when somebody's abused as a child or even as an, an adult, um, but I think especially as a child in plain sight of other, other, people who are right near you, people who are supposed to be your protectors, it does something to you internally that makes you question everything about your faith. And so just stepping inside of that church building becomes a trigger for you. And it becomes ex- extremely difficult not just to enter the church building where the abuse happened, but to enter any church building. And s- uh, and I think that's critical for people to understand that the just the church building can be such a trigger mm-hmm. that can cause a person to go into it, this is trauma that they've experienced mm-hmm. and we're talking about serious stuff here mm-hmm. and we often bypass that overlook it or we don't even think about it yeah. at all this is a very real part of the lives of people who have been victimized by abusers mm-hmm. and we we need to be aware of that well i want to i want to shift camera angles here for a little bit and i want to i want to look at survivors through the lens of church leaders because Survivors, uh, they get a really, really, really bad rap just over and over and over again. And, you know, their, their physical abuse or their sexual abuse almost inevitably turns into spiritual abuse. And I want to say that, that for the most part, church leaders who, who are, who are doing the spiritual abuse are very, very nearsighted. And so they can't see beyond themselves for whatever reason. And I'm not really going to get into what all those reasons could be, not in this episode anyway. But I can tell you this, that the way that they see these survivors is they're people who, yes, they probably got abused in the past, but it was in the past and the abuse um, may or may not have been bad, but but that's kind of irrelevant because... You know, after all, Jesus is the great healer. And if they just have enough faith, then they'll be able to have joy again. And and, oh, and after all, the Bible commands us to have joy in all circumstances. And so um, these people who are wallowing, quote unquote, I'm saying this in quotes because this is how they think of you. Those people who wallow in their sorrows they're clinging to bitterness and they just can't, um, they can't see the good in life. And so they're the Debbie Downers of the church and they're the ones who are bringing everybody else down. And, and after all, we're trying to set this atmosphere of, of peace and of joy and happiness. And these people keep coming into the church and they keep approaching the leadership and saying, we're struggling, we're suffering. Um, we can't move beyond our abuse and, and, and we're just, uh, 
we're in this bad place and we're depressed and we're anxious and we're having panic attacks. And, and so the church leaders see that as a weakness and a lack of faith. Now compound that with you, you start missing church services. And then the additional criticism steps in because now you're unfaithful. That's right. Now you are marked as an unfaithful Christian. And so the, the one thing, and my church knows this and I harp on it all the time and we still have people who use this terminology and it, it's worse than nails on a chalkboard to me. So they'll talk about faithful Christians. She's such a faithful Christian. What they mean by that is that they're a faithful attender, that they have a good attendance sheet, that they show up to church regularly. Beyond that, um, if you were to ask them what they mean by sister so-and-so being a, a faithful Christian, they don't really have a whole lot to, to give you. And And when I ask for specifics, what is it specifically that makes them a faithful Christian? Define that for me. They can't, they can't describe that to me. Now let me, and that's troublesome to me. Let me interject. Jimmy is not saying that faithful attendance isn't a good thing. It's that's wonderful. Right. It is. But for those who are in the category of, of having been abused, faithful attendance may be something that they are not able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a number of reasons, it, it, it could be of, they're triggered coming into the building. It could right. be that they don't. They're just not feel in a place. welcomed by the community. Right, right. It could be that they're rejected by the leaders for their quote unquote lack of faith. It could be, it could be a safety issue. It could be that their husbands are going to church there and their husbands are beating the living daylights out of them. And it's not safe for them to go to church. Right. It, it's, there, there's a host of reasons. Host of reasons, but too often, most often, those reasons are overlooked, and we connect the dots to a faithful Christian with a faithful attendee. Mm-hmm. And I, I love Jimmy that you're bringing that out, and that this is the focus of today's podcast. Yeah, and so you know, two podcasts ago, episode eighteen, I I talked about the castaways. Um, These are the people who are cast down or cast aside um, by the religious leaders or the religious community at large. Um, And these are the very people who Jesus surrounds himself with and intentionally seeks out. Um, Jesus loved, 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 loved the castaways. He loved the people who were, who were rejected by the religious community and especially in the Gospel of Luke. So the Gospel of Luke, more than the other Gospels, uh, Luke really focuses on, um, really two main categories, but one was women. Um, and the other was people who were poor and oppressed. And so Luke really, um, has a higher concentration of, of, of people who, uh, who Jesus sought out, who were both uh, either women or uh, they were poor and oppressed or both. And I really love that about Luke's gospel. And so in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is really, really protective of, of the castaways. And, and he uses that language. He uses that right. terminology. Yes. Uh, unfortunately in the English translation, we don't translate it that way. Um, but go back and listen to episode 18, and I, and I think you'll understand. Jesus absolutely has a heart for the people who've been rejected by the relig- religious community. Now, I'm going to bring you back in time 2,000 years. The religious castaways, the people who've been cast aside or, or rejected by the religious community, are, guess what? Not synagogue attenders. They don't, they don't go to church. Right. They don't show up to synagogue. One, because they're not welcome. Two, because a lot of them were diseased and because of um, certain restrictions within the Jewish law, you weren't allowed to show up with clean people 
because you I'm would thinking, make them unclean. Right. right. And I'm thinking of Je- when, when I picture Jesus, I picture him as dusty. Um, his sandals or his feet are dirty. He's mm-hmm. walking along these dusty roads and he's talking to the lepers who have been cast out Mm -hmm. and they're not allowed i mean according to jewish law at the time they weren't allowed to go anywhere near um other jewish people who were clean and there's jesus he's talking to the adulteress Mm -hmm. he he's goes where he you know other people are criticizing him for talking to such down people such Mm -hmm. uh sinful people but that's where you find jesus and we have taken that somehow and twisted it and made Jesus this, um, per- this. We've made him unapproachable. Uh, yeah. He, he's and unloving and, and sterling, judgmental and sterile and, and that we absolutely, but I see him as when, when I close my eyes and I picture Jesus, I picture him with the sick, the lonely, mm-hmm. the depressed, the downtrodden. The poor, mm-hmm. the, all of the ones that we are so quick to judge. Yeah, and, and and we might not like hearing that word judge, but we do. Mm-hmm. We judge such people, you know. Well, I think of the woman. You know, think of the woman with the issue of blood. Okay, so she's she's been hemorrhaging for for twelve years. All right, so if you think about that, um, under Jewish law, she was considered "quote unquote" unclean. Um, She was not allowed, as long as she was in that state, uh, she was not allowed to be around clean uh, people who were, who were um, ceremonial, ceremonially clean. Uh, She couldn't be around them. So not only was she dealing with this issue of blood for 12 years, but she was incredibly lonely, incredibly lonely. Um, She was embarrassed. She was humiliated. Um, she hadn't been to church in 12 years. Think about that. This woman had not graced a, a synagogue um, in and, 12 years. And 12 years is a long time. Yeah. Very, very long time. And look at Jesus' and, response to her. Right. And I... I she, he doesn't say, well, why, you know, where were why you? didn't you have more yeah. faith? Why, yeah. why didn't, you know... Mm-hmm. I'm the great healer. Why didn't you believe that that I, I could heal you? And you know, why didn't you see more doctors? Or why didn't you do this? Or what did you do to bring this on? Or what's your what's your eating habit? You know, he, why why have you been bleeding for twelve years? You must be doing something. He didn't give her any of that. No. He didn't lecture her about not being at synagogue. Jesus simply healed her, and then he has compassion on her. And I love, you know, Jesus really often tells people, go in peace. It's interesting. Some people, he uses the language come, right? So yes. come is, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, uh, he draws people to him. He calls certain people to this high, high standard of discipleship, of denying themselves, taking up their cross daily and following him. Other people, he does the exact opposite. There are people that are clawing their way to follow Jesus and his answer is, no, don't follow me. You go in peace. You go home. Go be with your family. And and if you look at the people who he's telling that to, it's the people who are most lonely. I mean, there's there's a very clear pattern in the Gospels that the people who's, who Jesus is telling go, these are the people who are the most lonely, the most alienated, um, the most sorrowful, and... He doesn't tell them, come, come follow me. He tells them, go, go away from me. Go home. Go be with your family. Go, go that's find a, peace. That's something that we rarely think about. Rarely. Almost um, never. Get right. Never, ever. And that was a central part the, of Jesus' ministry. Right, right. Was sending, pe- sending certain people away Some, and calling other right. people and to I him. I don't know that I've ever really myself thought about that, Jimmy. Yeah. You know, that, that's an incredible point that you brought out there. But so, our Jesus that, um, we have different views of Jesus. And it's interesting that where we are in our lives, we have a, we take on a different view of who 
Jesus is. And for the abuse, I like how you started this podcast. There is a, a, a lot of um, misconception and hurt and pain when you've struggled, like the woman with the issue of blood, for mm-hmm. years and years and years. Well, put an abusive person in that situation, and you cry out, where is my Lord? And then you have church leaders who, instead of tending to your pain, mm-hmm. have further cast you out and said, go, you're, you're not faithful. You, you know, where have you been? You're not faithful. Yeah, and, and I can I can remember a time um, fairly recently when you know my family. Um, I'm talking about my wife and mostly my wife and myself. Um, there was something that had happened, and and uh, I don't really need to share details, but but we were at a at a point of crisis, and it's rare that we find ourselves there, but you know uh, sometimes we find this point where it's, we're just at a nine one one moment. Right. You, life, I call it life happens yeah. and, it, and, and it does for everyone. And all of us are susceptible to, to having these moments of crisis. And so I was actually with a friend um, when I got a phone call and it just, it just, it was a horrible phone call. And I loved her response. And she said, Jimmy, she said, we're going to stop everything right now. She said, we're going to triage this. We're going to take this pain that's in your life right now, and we're going to triage this. I had never heard that that's, expression before. Oh, that's beautiful. From, from right. somebody, have, somebody who's a Christian, have, right. somebody who's a believer. Right. And so, you know, and, and she did. She showed up to our house, and she nurtured Natalie and, and myself and That's beautiful. and she she played with our kids and really interactive but really shepherded us in in that moment through that pain yeah and and that to me that will always stick with me as one of one of one of the um, climactic moments in my life where somebody really, got it somebody really understood trauma and pain and and didn't say well i'll be praying for you you know and that's on the nice end right for christians the the not so nice end is well you know you just don't have enough faith or you know all the things that we talk about and harp on in, in in our podcast that's on the on the meaner end but she didn't do any of that. She said, mm-hmm. we're going to triage this. We're going to isolate this pain right now. And we're going to confront it. And we're going to deal with it. And we're going to make it better. Wow. Mm-hmm. And and I was like, why don't we, why don't churches act as triage centers? That's really, a, where we I take love people, that phrase. Yeah. Where we take people who are absolutely at a critical moment in their life. And we drop everything and we say, you know what? We are going to triage this right now. Not in five minutes, not in five days, not in five weeks. We're going to triage this right now. And we're going to get you through this pain. We're going to figure it out. We're going to find out what the source is. We're going to find out, you know, who's causing this or what's causing this. We're going to triage it and we're going to, we're going to shepherd you. Until you're well. Right. I, as, as you're talking, and I, I can see your face, our listeners can't, but I see there were tears. Um, there's a passion in Jimmy that I can see. And I, I'm certain that that strengthened you, Jimmy, for you Absolutely. and Natalie. Absolutely. In a way that um, nothing else could. And it spoke moment. God back into our lives. Not that, it, not that he ever he, left. Not that he left, but when we are in dire pain, we need the physical, we, we need somebody here. And I always say we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what we need yeah. to be. The hands and the feet of Jesus. And your friend was that mm-hmm. at that moment. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And I'll we, never forget it. Right. I was going to say. And my we wife will never, never forget, forget it. Never forget that. We'll never, for, never no, forget that. No. And I, and it, it made me realize, 
how poorly I had done at at shepherding people. Not because I don't care about people, but because I let busyness get in the way. And, and you know, for her, it didn't matter. Like, none of that mattered. And when she showed up at our house... That's so... She literally awesome, dropped everything. That really is. Everything. That's, that's how it should be. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't it like, be. you know, it wasn't like a weeks long process and it wasn't this right. big drawn. It was literally in, in one day, there was a very crystal clear solution. Mm-hmm. There was, I mean, everything was worked out and in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. We were well. I mean, right. the, the, the issue had been dealt with and we just needed wisdom. We just and needed right. somebody, you know, we had been dealt this really right. horrible thing and, and, and we needed, we needed guidance. We needed shepherding. And so I told and her, you I needed said, it then, yeah, not in absolutely. four weeks, um, not call a counselor and make an appointment. And, or, you know, and I, I don't know what the issue was, Jimmy, and I don't need to know, but. Often we'll say, well, um, you, you need to go see a therapist mm-hmm. or, um, you need to go to that agency downtown and make an appointment yeah. or you need, yeah. you know, and that's delaying and, um, actually increasing a person's pain. Yeah. And to have some. Now that doesn't mean that you can't schedule an appointment no, for I'm that not person. That but all. in that moment, when somebody's yeah. in crisis, there is stuff that you can do right in that right. moment. And, and I'm, Ever since, ever since that happened with us, I've made it a point when somebody's in crisis who's sitting right in front of me, I deal with it right then and there. I literally drop everything and say, let's, and I use that terminology now, let's triage this. I really love that. Let's, let's figure this out. And we may not be able to solve the the entire issue right now, but right now we're going to triage it and, and we're going to tend to your, to your wounds. Sometimes. Right now isn't just the presence of a friend healing. Absolutely. For me, it is. Right. Yeah. Just the mere presence of somebody with you. Yeah. And isn't that what Jesus did? Absolutely. He sat among the lowly. He sat at their table and ate with them, mm-hmm. was criticized harshly for it. Yeah. But, you know, all, all of the above. And I think the point we get back to, um, our churches and faith and you know maybe you can zoom in on that yeah i'm going to close with the passage because um it's in hebrews hebrews 11 it's the faith chapter but it's a part of hebrews 11 that um most people don't give much attention to and i think it's the most important part of hebrews 11 it's like the one part that people avoid and it's the most powerful and most important part and uh so i'm going to read it it's it's just a short few verses but here's here's one of the main points that we want to make is that when you're struggling, when you're struggling with your faith, when you're struggling with not being able to show up at church for a season, uh, to show up to worship, when you've been cast aside, when you're not accepted or welcomed by your religious community, um, don't think less of yourself. In fact, this passage in Hebrews 11 elevates you to a level, uh, actually catapults you to a level of honor and strength and beauty um, that far surpasses any of us other Christians. So here's this passage. Uh, It's in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 32, it says this, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, and I love this part, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weaknesses. I love that part I too. I love that also. They were made strong out of weaknesses. I love that. We look at weakness as a bad thing. Right. Hebrews eleven looks at weaknesses as as a, a strength building process. Okay, um, they became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured. <laughs> 
refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Now, I was talking to mom about that passage, and we don't get the indication that they refused to be released because they had this strong faith and, you know, they were ready to die for their faith. Right. You get the indication that they were just tired and they were ready. They were bummed. They were ready right. to pass right. on to a better life. They were just, they were tapping out. Yeah. And there's, yeah. there's, in this passage, there's no indication that it's because they had this powerful, strong faith and they were ready to die for the Lord. The indication is that they refused to accept release. In other words, release could have been granted they just to these laid people. Down. I, I picture them as just laying, kind of laying down. And yeah, saying, they were I'm, ready. I'm, they yeah, were ready to I'm be done. done. Right. So that they might rise again to a better life. Um, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Now, this is not metaphor here. These are people literally being persecuted to this point. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Does this sound familiar to any of you? And I love this next phrase. Of whom the world was not worthy. In other words, they were elevated to a point that the world was not worthy of these of these believers. I think that is the most powerful statement of all out of this whole passage. And I hope that as people listen to this, they can feel some of this, just feel the connection and feel what that means. As abused people, we are, often feel we are not worthy of anything, Mm -hmm. let alone to be called, you know, to this level of worthiness. Well, that's because all all these things that are mentioned here is what churches are coming back and 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 saying this is this is a, a lack of faith. This is you know, you're showing weakness. You're the Debbie Downer. You're the person you're suffering with anxiety and depression and um uh, panic attacks and, you know, eating disorders and, and, uh, drug addictions and all these different things that uh, people might be suffering with as a result of trauma. The church is coming back. Failed marriages. We right. talked about that. We did. Um, yes. Failed marriages is like somehow that's become the unforgivable sin in, in the church. And sometimes marriages just fail because relationships break down and they fail. And I think of the, the uh, Samaritan woman who had five failed marriages and the man she was with wasn't her husband. Right. Jesus not only acknowledges that um, in a non-judgmental way, because I think he understands it. He understands the root of those five that, failed and that's marriages. that's important. Right. And that the person she was with, I get the indication that the person she was with was not her husband because she got to a point where she just didn't, she didn't know how to trust again. Mm-hmm. So Jesus reveals himself in that moment as the Messiah. And she goes around, she's telling everybody, brings the whole village back to see him. I love that passage because she is the epitome of the person who's rejected by the church today. Somebody who's a, you know, she's, she's a sinner and she's, you know, she brought this all on herself and all the things that we hear. So anyway, Jesus or, or, um, not Jesus, um, the writer of Hebrews in this passage says, you know, the world was not worthy of these people. And then right after that says they were wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. In other words, these are people who didn't have a home. They didn't fit they, in. They weren't right. They, and they, they were literally in hiding. So these are people were. who they're under severe persecution. They're, literally hiding in deserts, in mountains, in caves. These are not, you know, the churchgoers who are wearing their Sunday best and putting on it, slapping on a smile right. and showing up. Mark and checking off the attendance yep. sheet. These are people who are hiding in caves. They're hiding on mountaintops. They're hiding in the desert. Uh, 
they're living their lives in hiding and they're hunkered down, not knowing where their next move is, not knowing what the next day is going to bring, not knowing whether they're going to live another day or not. And his expression for them is the world was not worthy of them. I love that. I'm so love grateful, that. Jimmy, that you um, brought this passage out to us. I, I think it's one of the most needed messages that any of us can ever hear. So we're going to leave you with our truth bomb for today. And our truth bomb is just simply this. When you're ridiculed for your lack of faith, remember that the world is not worthy of you. You are awesome. You are worthy. And we're going to leave you on that note. Thank you for listening to this episode. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.